back once again. We're at chapter 20, verse 25 of the book of 1 Kings. And number thee an army, like the army that you have lost, horse for horse and chariot for chariot. And we will fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. And he hearkened unto their voice and did so. Voice and did so. My voice is giving out, of course, and obviously. Verse 26. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben-Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. Notes. Exactly, word for word, jot for jot, as the prophet had said would actually happen. Verse 27, And the children of Israel were numbered, and were all present, and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of birds, but the Syrians filled the entire country. <laughs> uh, notes, you can almost see the 100 to 1 odds right here, but once again, little as much if God is in it. Verse 28, and there came a man of God and spoke unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the, Is because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills, but he is not God of the valleys. Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Notes. Whether this man of God was the same person as the prophet of verses 13 and 22 is not really actually clear. Uh, this was being done for Israel by the Lord for their benefit, but also that neighboring nations would actually learn of his power, and that his name might be magnified among them. Verse 29, And they pitched over against the other seven days, and so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined. And the children of Israel slew of the Syrians an hundred thousand footmen in one day. Notes, they did so by the power of God, for that was the only way it actually could have been done. Uh, for any, for ten people to think they can take on one hundred, uh, it's ridiculous. I mean, it's just not going to happen unless some kind of special force is behind those ten people. Verse 30. But the rest fled to Aphek into the city. And there was a wall fell upon twenty and seven thousand of the men who were left. And Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city into an inner chamber. Notes. Evidently the twenty-seven thousand men had gotten on the wall or else were sitting against the wall. And the Lord caused it to fall. Whatever happened it was caused totally by the Lord. Uh, like knocking a domino onto a pile of ants. Well... Uh, that's a pretty good figure as to what we are compared to God. I mean, you you become his enemy and you're going to become his prey. Verse 31. And his servants said unto him, Behold, now we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Let us, I pray you, put sackcloth on our loins and ropes around our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Preadventure he will save your life. So they sat cloth on their so they girded sackcloth on their loins and put ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben Hadad says, I pray you let me live. And he Ahab said, Is he who is Ben Hadad yet alive? He is my brother. Notes Right there we have a most ridiculous position for Ahab to take. But uh, compare Ben-Hadad's arrogance and insolence to verses 6 all the way up to about verse 10. Here he is thinking he's the rooster, but now he's the hen all of a sudden. He's been cut down quite a bit. That arrogant attitude he has has been brought to absolutely nothing. Verse 33. Now the men did diligently observe whether anything would come from him and did hastily catch it. And they said, Your brother Ben-Hadad. Then he said, Go ye, bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him, and he caused him to come up into his chariot. And Ben-Hadad said unto him, The cities which my father took from your father I will restore. And you shall make streets for you in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. Then said Ahab, I will send you away with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and sent him away. Notes. Boy, did this ever tick God off. Verse 35, we shall read a little bit about it. 
And a certain man of the sons of the prophet said unto his neighbors in the word of the Lord, Smite me, I pray you. And the man refused to smite him. Notes. Now this neighbor was a companion prophet, and hence the seriousness of his ignoring the word of the Lord. In fact, this was a school of the prophets, which owed its existence more than likely to Samuel, who began it about two hundred years before. Then said he unto him, Because you have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, behold, as soon as you are departed from me, a lion shall kill you. And as soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and killed him. Notes. Well, at first glance, it may seem as if this punishment was severe. However, again, I must emphasize to ignore the plain, clear, and simple word of God is a most serious thing. Verse 37. Then he found another man and said, Smite me, I pray you. And the man did smote him, so that in smiting him he wounded him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way, and disguised himself with ashes upon his face. And as the king passed by, he cried unto the king, and he said, Your servant went out into the midst of the battle, and behold, a man turned aside, and brought a man unto me, and said, Keep this man. If by any means he be missing, then shall your life be for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. Notes uh, this prophet is presenting a object lesson to Ahab. Verse 40. And as your servant was busy here and there, he was escaped. And the king of Israel said unto him, So shall your judgment be, yourself have decided it. Notes. Ahab himself now pronounces that the judgment is actually just. Verse 41. And he hasted and took the ashes away from his face, and the king of Israel discerned him that he was a prophet. And he said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, because you have let go out of your hand a man whom I appointed to utter destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life, and your people for his people. Notes oh, Ahab has seriously displeased the Lord in letting Ben-Hadad go free. He will now pay the price, even though it will be a couple of years in the coming. Verse 43, And the king of Israel went to his house, heavy and displeased, and came to Samaria. Chapter 21, And it came to pass after these things that Naboth the Jezreelite had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab king of Samaria. Notes, the, uh, the entirety of this chapter concerns this actual vineyard. Naboth's vineyard is a type of the spiritual inheritance that every child of God actually has. As his vineyard bordered Ahab's palace, so our spiritual inheritance, which is considered the vineyard, it actually kind of borders the world in a figurative kind of way. And Ahab spoke unto Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near unto my house, and I will give you for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seem good to you, I will give you the worth of it in money. Notes. Very, very interesting right here. The same pressure that was applied to Ahab against Naboth to sell his vineyard will be applied to us by the forces of darkness to compromise our convictions. As this battle was to the death, so will the battle that we fight be unto the death. We have but one of two choices. We can refuse Satan in any part that he has, uh, or two, we can sell out to uh, Ahab, uh, symbolic of Satan in this case. The first one will bring physical death but spiritual life. The second one will bring physical life but spiritual death. Uh, well, Satan professes to have a better vineyard all the time. Well, if he has a better vineyard, why does he want yours? You ever thought about that? And we must pick up in chapter 21, verse 3 of 1 Kings. Thank you, and God bless.